Hi everyone, it is 2 p.m. Uh, we're just gonna give one more minute for people to settle in. I see the numbers are still climbing, so we'll allow people to connect and we will uh, get started with our session. I'll get us started with uh, maybe some housekeeping things uh, that we can pass the time uh, until um, we tend to our presentation for today. Uh, so first of all, I wanna welcome everyone. Um, I'm Aynat, I'm the clinical manager for the Behavior Support for Seniors program at the Central Lynn, uh, based at Baycrest. And uh, I uh, wanna welcome you to our be uh, Behavior Support, uh, COVID and Responsive Behaviors, Lessons Learned from the First Wave Education Series. This is our third session uh, of, uh, of our out of four sessions that we're providing through this series so far. Um, all the sessions have been very engaging and very rewarding um, and, and participation has been wonderful. Um, this series is a collaboration of the Behavior Support for Seniors Program at the Toronto Central Lynn and the Center for Learning, Research and Innovation at Baycrest, the Psychogeriatric Resource Consultant Program uh, and RGP Toronto, and the Toronto and uh, Alzheimer's Society, the Alzheimer Society of Toronto. So a few technical um, uh, things for you to know. Uh, please be aware that this session is recorded. It's also live streamed to YouTube through a private link to allow people that don't have access to Zoom in their organizations to participate. I would ask that you mute yourself unless you're speaking. And when you do wish to comment or ask a question, um, then you could either unmute yourself, you could respond on the chat, we will be following that, and you could also um, kind of raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button um, next to your name on the participant list. Um, we will, uh, and this is a comment for the speakers, we will leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end uh, for some questions and discussion. I want uh, the people on YouTube, if you are on YouTube and watching through a live link, I want you to know that there is a bit of a 30 second lag uh, between our time here and your time there. So if it takes 30 seconds for us to get to your question, um, just keep that in mind. Our moderator um, will be copying any comments made on the YouTube chat to uh, the Zoom chat so we can respond to them. Uh, if you are unable, uh, if you want to be able to comment on YouTube, you need to sign into your Google account. Uh, the recordings of the session and the, and the slide deck will be shared with participants after the sessions. Uh, we typically put recordings on our um, uh, Center for Learning, Research and Innovation uh, website, as well as our BSO website, and we will send and post those links on the chat shortly. And we will also send them to you after the session. Uh, just for you to know to expect that at the end of the session, we will you'll see a poll coming up on your screen um, to collect your feedback. We rely on this feedback to make those sessions more engaging and, and more um, helpful to our audiences. So we will appreciate your feedback on the session. Our topic for today, um, so within the COVID series, our topic for today is uh, about helping teams on how to respond to caregiver anxiety during COVID. This is uh, a topic that has emerged um, and, and uh, brought to our attention throughout the pandemic by many of our partners, long-term care and community. And I'm sure is pressing for many people on the call. And uh, I'm really honored to present our speakers for today that really bring with them a lot of credibility and practical knowledge into this talk today. Our first speaker is Laura Petta. Laura is a social worker, long-term care lead, working as, a, as our behavior support caregiver specialist and based at the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto. Uh, since achieving her master's degree in social work, she's worked primarily with older adults and caregivers in both the community and long-term care settings. The bulk of her long-term uh, care experience was acquired while working for the long-term care um, um, Budson, uh, uh, ombudsman, sorry, Laura, I'm, uh, you could probably pronounce it better, in, in Santa Clara County, California, and New York City. Uh, more recently at Dixon Hall uh, here in Toronto, she worked as a client intervention um, 
a worker providing case management services to seniors and adults with disabilities living in the urban setting. Currently, she assists family, friends, friends, caregivers who support a person living with dementia in one of the 36 long-term care homes in across the Toronto Central Lynn. She represents Alzheimer's Society of, of Toronto as a member of the Resource Development Committee for Family Councils Ontario, where members work collaboratively to produce accessible literature to help support family councils across the province of Ontario. So a lot of relevant experience that Laura brings with her to this talk and together and joins her today um, is another great uh, speaker, Hazel Sebastian, who is a psychogeriatric resource consultant working with the RGP of Toronto and uh, employee of St. Michael's Hospital. She has worked exclusively in healthcare since uh, she graduated with a master's degree in social work. She has extensive experience in healthcare and working with geriatric population. In her role as a psychogeriatric resource consultant, Hazel enjoys using her knowledge and skills to support staff working with people facing mental and physical health challenges. She represents St. Michael's Hospital at the Toronto Spider Table and provides uh, consultative services to and provides consultative services to members who support clients living in the community with acute elevated risks. She is passionate about her work and values uh, uh, being a collaborative member of teams and contributing to teams work. I can absolutely vouch for that, Hazel. And you're also no stranger to um, to our forums and 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 uh, and virtual rounds. So with that, I will pass on the torch to you um, and to your uh, very uh, fascinating conversation today. Thank you. Uh, Laura and Hazel, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Okay. Let me... Can I also come on screen? I guess not. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Hello? Can you hear me? You. Hazel, you, you, we can hear you well. And if you release your camera, I will be able to see your face alongside the slide. It's not letting me. Is somebody else ca controlling that? It says cannot start video, fail to start the video camera. Please select another video camera in settings. I don't know that. OK, let's, let's okay, uh, let it go. It's fine. Um, just so we can hear you clearly. Let's just continue with the slide. Um, it's, it could be a connection problem. OK, then. Thank you. Um, let me start again, then. Thank you, Annette, for the introduction. Hello everyone, it's really great to be here with you today and thank you so much for being with us. We are in the second wave of COVID-19 and we have learned many important lessons from our experience with the first one. So we would, this, this in-service was developed out of support to all staff recognizing the current pressures, worrying about getting sick yourself, bringing it home for to your family or an, on top of all these things you are working with staff shortages we also recognize there is added pressure to you of caregivers having to be external during covid and their varied reactions to the situation this session is to help us as a team to think about the ways we can support the family caregivers during this stressful time Slide second or two. Next slide, uh, Mario. The presenters today, Laura and I are the co-presenters of this session. Laura Petta is a social worker. She is the long-term care lead of Alzheimer's Society of Toronto. And myself, Hazel Sebastian, psychogeriatric resource consultant of RGP Toronto. We want to acknowledge the contribution made by Haley Yola, PRC lead, in developing this presentation. Next slide. Mario, next slide. 
before we get in get started with our presentation we want to state that we have no conflict of interest and we have not received any financial support for this program other than the support from ministry of health and long term care next slide the con the content presented today is based on emerging information and evidence based next slide this is the third webinar in the series to share lessons learned and stories of success regarding covid-19 to open the series we we learned about the evolution of the dementia isolation toolkit and heard about how in practice team can use this tool better develop plans to support individuals who require isolation in week 2 we worked at forging meaningful connections in the time of covid supporting communications and resources for activities and engagement in the face of covid restrictions today we will consider the impact of these restrictions on caregivers during the pandemic and explore how we can enhance communication at this time in session 4 on december 8 marilyn by campbell geriatric addiction specialist bso behavior support for senior program seniors program baycrest will be presenting on supporting smoking cessation in long term care in the era of covid-19 the clinical complexities and solutions please don't miss this Marilyn has a lot of knowledge and experience to share with you. Next slide please. Our learning objectives for today are to explore with you the role of family, friend, caregivers in community and long-term care home settings. We want to describe the impact of living through a pandemic on family caregivers and on staff. We then want to identify supporting communication skills for staff to use in the moment when responding to family caregiver anxiety next slide please now we want to ask mario to um launch a, a launch a menti poll and okay mario i can't see the number it's not a problem everybody so the menti poll is equal to www.menti.com and use the code 91052409 and 9 to answer this question what examples of caregiving anxiety have you seen thank you mario the code is again on the screen 9105249 and and if people are finding it complicated you could also uh just post on the chat um as well you're seeing the answers coming in grieving frequent calls to unit lack of faith and trust i agree tired no way to go short tempered emotional burnout wow emotional frustration blaming nine one one involvement not eating in the community probably there is a lot of calls to 911 families frequently calling 
they are short tempered they have no way to go they this burnout upset now the the bold ones are the ones those answers are the ones many participants have identified as some of the examples of anxiety that they have seen and we have a lot of them here and i think this shows your experience as well as your awareness of caregiver anxiety and the caregivers with whom you are working thank you thank you for sharing it's uh, wonderful to see uh, that how attuned to family anxieties you are in your work there are some themes uh, in the whole um, word cloud here we are seeing similar themes and people are seeing the same situations uh, probably in the long term care home as well as in the community so mario if you can launch the second question and the second question we have for you is sorry what are some of the challenges family caregivers confront when trying to take a break and to answer this you again go back to menti.com and use the code 9105249 financial yes thank you andrea for suggesting that guilt money no replacement to take their to take turns with them there's no one else they can rely on they are all alone isolated worry worries is definitely you see that another common one here lack of response i'm oh, sorry hazel another one here might be the uh the person living with dementia's refusal to go uh, somewhere else for respite. They feel um, insecure and they don't know. Sorry. So nobody is available because of quarantine, uh, guilt, feeling that care won't be as effective without them there. So they feel a lot of anxiety in leaving their uh, um, loved ones and going. Good afternoon, calling Canadian Appliance Stores. As you arrange a delivery for your fridge, if you could please call back at four one six seven eight two five nine zero zero. My extension is two one four. I'm also sending you an email. You could reply to my email like in the waiting for you. Feeling Post abandonment. One three one six nine one. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Sorry about that. That's my home line. No proper support for the person to care for. Guilt. No emotional support. Many answers are coming in. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. And it shows again how shows your knowledge of challenges caregivers face in taking a break. It and then it causes burnout and probably they are very stressed. And you see this. when in their encounters with you a lot of guilt guilt is coming up very um a pro predominantly here feelings of abandonment reduced in home support yes anxious about caregivers and sometimes maybe they don't want in home a uh, support to come in because they are worried about covid coming into the home with the uh, caregivers the professional caregivers who come in to assist them thank you anet for your message so now i want to um, hand uh, turn it over to laura to walk us through some of the situations that we can see the caregivers in the community and uh, and in long term care homes laura thank you hazel that easily could have happened to me so don't sweat it 
Um, so I'm here today to talk about a case study that I, I experienced recently um, with Sandra. Um, so Sandra was a caregiver that I came across who really wanted to be the substitute decision maker for a resident. However, the son was uh, there at admission um, with the resident and the responsibility fell on him. Uh, the son was an unresponsive substitute decision maker, and he made it very clear to staff quickly that he had no desire to have this job. Uh, the facility staff were eager to assess the resident, uh, their, his cognition, and to perform a MOCA. Now, Sandra, being the niece and the regular visitor to the resident, insisted um, that the exam could not take place. She refused all pharmacological uh, interventions and behavior strategies uh, that the facility wanted to implement to address his responsive behaviors. Uh, she was frustrated and felt that the facility kept her in the dark because she wasn't the substitute decision maker. And uh, despite her obvious desire to be involved in the uncle's care, she, she couldn't understand this. Uh, this family had a deep mistrust for facility staff. Additionally, the niece worked in a long-term care home business office and felt that she had a really good understanding of what the facility should be doing um, and what they should be offering to her uncle. But instead, she was convinced that they wanted to make their own lives easier by medicating him. To make things more complicated, the uncle was admitted February 2020 and soon after he contracted COVID in March. Uh, initially, when he got COVID, he was misdiagnosed um, by the facility staff and ultimately the resident was sent to hospital where he spent several weeks on a ventilator. When he eventually returned to the long-term care home, you can imagine um, how the family reacted to staff. They felt that the facility staff were highly incompetent and uh, they questioned every single encounter or treatment that the, the care team tried to uh, present to the family on behalf of the uncle. Consequently, and not surprisingly, staff felt increasingly frustrated with this family uh, when interfa interfacing with them each day. Staff recorded every negative exchange between themselves, the resident, and the family. And they recorded the numerous responsive behaviors of the resident. Each time the staff brought questions to deal with responsive behaviors to the family, it was met with defensiveness and hostility. Family members brought in cigarettes, enabling the resident to smoke because they wanted to give him a pick-me-up and they knew that would cheer him up even though uh, this posed major health risks for the residents since he suffered from COPD. Uh, had this not stopped, ultimately what we would have done is we would have contacted Marilyn White Campbell, the geriatric uh, addiction specialist who's coming, uh, so who's speaking next week. Um, and we would have asked her for her, her assistance in this matter. Next, next slide, Mario. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about caregiving in the community. Um, so, although most caregivers have a positive outlook towards caregiving and are generally coping well, you'll see here that in 2018, the Change Foundation found that 31% were not coping well emotionally and had high levels of stress and negative emotions. Um, Caregiving's a time-consuming job. You'll see here, 43% of caregivers spent up to four hours a week caregiving. A third of them spend 10 or more hours a week. And these hours are not only during the day, 50% at least occasionally stay up all night to provide care to the person that they're supporting. A third of caregivers take on basic medical care, such as changing bandages, monitoring, and administrating medications, reminders about physio, while 18% take on some medical procedures such as changing G-tubes, changing dressings, and giving injections. 
Next slide, Mario, please. So caregiving in the long-term care home. Um, now these stats are, are from the staffing study that was released in July of this year. So they, they revealed these uh, statistics. And in 2018, so this is all before COVID, 3.6 million Canadians reported providing care for parents or parents-in-law. Another million supported a spouse or a partner. It's estimated that family caregivers contribute to the equivalent of between 26 to 72 million, or sorry, billion dollars to our society each year. 13% of these caregivers provided care to a loved one who is living in an institution or a facility such as a long-term care home. 20% of care is provided by external caregivers, so that's family friend caregivers. And family members assist in care. Oh, can everybody make sure they're muted? Sorry. Thank you. Family members assisting with caregivers gave over 12, 10 hours per week with more hours provided when the person is older or had severe health conditions such as dementia. So it's also important to note in that last slide is that um, caregivers play a major role. They help with feeding, grooming, washing, toileting, exercise, social and emotional support, memory support, mobilization, and in some cases, translation. Currently, to be deemed an essential caregiver, there are some, these are some of the activities that people are expected to be taking on as an essential caregiver. So it's not surprising that the government uh, established this role for caregivers that are interested in being an essential caregiver. Additionally, when Sandra was attending the home way back in February before this was happening, um, she was at the home daily, forcing her uncle to exercise um, and helping with his memory support as well as grooming. So we should all be acknowledging, and I know operators, residents and families feel strongly about how important family and friend caregivers are to the quality of care for the residents living in the long-term care homes and that they're also a major part of the care team. Okay, this next slide, slide 11. Um, pressures of COVID-19 in the community. So having to let, I think Hazel touched on this at the beginning, having to let PSWs into your home who have been in multiple places, staff not staying for the full uh, amount of time, maybe the, maybe the resident or sorry, the person that they're there caring for is turning them away. Uh, the timing can be unpredictable uh, due to weather like today or um, longer time with the person ahead of you. Uh, high turnover rate. It's hard to follow a behavior plan in the community um, as there is a lot of turnover and you might not get the same person coming on a regular basis. There can be language barriers. Misunderstanding the role of the PSW. Some, some people think that they're at your house to help you clean um, when in fact they're there to provide direct care. Uh, respite clothes. Programs are closed at the minute, like the adult day programs, uh, which gave family members and uh, any type of caregiver really uh, a bit of a break, a consistent break. They would know they could go grocery shopping on this day, this time, go see the dentist, the doctor. And now since that's all virtual, it's much more difficult. They're also having to help the person who are in, is in that group and support them on Zoom. So now they're also in close proximity when there would be a time that they would have a break. Um, again, client can refuse to allow community staff in, uh, missed appointments for whatever reason, and a breakdown of communication. So it may be the case that a community PSW uh, isn't an accident or isn't able to get to um, their next client and they might they may phone in to the agency but the there's a breakdown in the agency doesn't always necessarily let the family or the uh, client know that they wouldn't be coming in that day so they're left waiting and they're getting increasingly frustrated 
Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about here is uh, pressures of COVID in critical staff shortages in long-term care homes. Let's acknowledge the current realities and the pressure points for direct care staff within long-term care homes during the pandemic. So diagnosis of COVID-19, uh, maybe they've failed the screening test, uh, anxiety around getting COVID themselves and bringing it home to their families. They've had to choose just one job to work at at a long-term care home. Uh, misinformation about how COVID's spreading and definitely concerns about PPE. Um, being able to get their tests in a reasonable amount of time, I believe that's better, but still it's, it's tricky. Um, burnout, uh, maybe they are also looking after someone at home, an older person or their children. Uh, many, many staff members took early retirement if they could, if they were eligible. And agencies are sometimes refusing to send staff or agency staff are not willing to return to some of the care homes. So um, get, staying on that slide for a minute here, in the case of Sandra, staff were going, growing increasingly frustrated because of the uncle's attitude. He was making degrading comments towards them. Um, meanwhile, staff are coping and working during the second wave, there's an outbreak in the home, sh staff shortages, their own feelings and anxieties about COVID and bringing it home to their families. And then Sandra suddenly couldn't go into the home. So since she lives farther away, she was did not apply for essential caregiver, uh, the essential caregiver role, excuse me. Instead, she had two other family members who lived closer to the home apply for that status. And they, they were accepted and they were able to get into the home. However, um, instead of her daily visits, she's replaced these with daily multiple phone calls and the phone's not stopping ringing. And Sandra has been projecting her anxiety through the phone about her uncle's care. And her anxiety has increased so much because of what she's seeing in the news and everything else. And she's worried that he's not receiving his weekly exercise. She's wondering who's helping him with his grooming as she used to do. She's also still has all that mistrust um, because of COVID first wave and him getting sick. So she's constantly calling to check up on staff and to be sure that they're not failing to provide the care that she thinks that he should be, he should be receiving. Next slide. So I touched on this a little bit, family and friend caregiver perceptions. Um, you know, these are all situations that everybody's experiencing. I know we're all a little edgy because of COVID and we want Christmas to be normal and I don't know. It's it's not looking that way. The holidays aren't looking normal. Um, but we're seeing in the news all the time about how long-term care homes are are not not dealing with COVID right. How they're having uh, increased uh, outbreaks and people are passing away. The caregiver is feeling like they're not part of the team. Um, because now they can't not only go in physically, but they, they can't go in person for their care plan meeting. Um, they can't lay eyes on their person. There's a lack of information at some homes. Um, at, we're hearing expert opinions from doctors, from uh, officials saying, if you have a, a person in a long-term care home, take them out. Um, and then there's the general community concern about a lack of PPE. So um, when, when, I, when I talk next about this slide, I, I want to talk about communication and how important it is. And this is something that we've seen in the homes currently. Um, consistent communication is so important. And I, I noticed actually in one of Hazel's homes, and it's an insurmountable amount of work, but if you do an e-bulletin or you have something happening to get information out to caregivers, and this was a home that did have some COVID deaths, unfortunately, um, but 
by them being completely transparent about what was happening, what unit things were happening on, what was going on, what their interventions were, by them getting ahead of the concern, there was a dramatic drop in the, in the constant calls that they were receiving from caregivers. Um, again, you can send out emails, like even if it's one big email blast per week to let everybody know what's happening. Send pictures of the resident, let them see. I know there was one home we were talking about that had every Friday they'd have, even though the unit was locked down, they would still have a big party and everybody would have dinner at the doors of their hallway and music would be going. I mean, that's where I wanna live when I'm older, I swear. Um, regular person to communicate. This is also really important. Is it going to be the social worker? Is it going to be the director of care? Is it going to be the BSO lead? I don't know who you're going to choose who makes sense in your home, but it's nice to have one person consistently available to communicate with the caregivers who are phoning 20 times a day because then that way you can put parameters around it and you can say, okay, look, I'm not available 20 times a day, but if you save up all your questions, I can promise to give you 10 minutes on this day at this time. And maybe you have more than one family you need to do that for, but I would urge you that you have one family representative, usually the substitute decision maker, where you would let that person call and you'd have that 10 minute conversation just to check in and everybody feels a little bit more in control and everybody feels heard and it, it really helps remarkably. Be mindful of what you say. Um, everybody's on edge and uh, maybe, you know, what we can do in these situations is normalizing statements like uh, when we're faced with this situation, people might feel stressed or angry or front loading statements like I'm like what I just said, I'm happy to chat with you as soon as I wrap up here. Um, instead of going, I don't know. <laughs> let me you say I, I can try to find the person who can help you with this. Just find opportunities to agree and to work together. Um, I, let me see here. Don't avoid families and by having these discussions because in a way that escalates things even more. I mentioned setting the clear boundaries. It works beautifully. Um, if you, if you can carve out the time to do it and find a good staff with a nice rapport with the family member, it really works well. Um, we can only control ourselves. We can, I, I know it's hard not to show your stress and your frustration on your face, but keep in mind, you, if you present, if you're, if you're calm in your demeanor, it helps the caregiver remain calm. These caregivers are feeling really, uh, removed from the situation and isolated and out of control. Um, also, uh, one thing I want we should look at is follow through with what you say you're going to do. Okay. And that really is so important because it builds credibility. Um, and also what happens is if you, if you come across a situation, you're not in this alone. You have an entire team accessible to you. You are part of a huge team at one of these long-term care homes and larger still is the BSO community. So we all have to work together. And if you don't have the answer, let us know. And somebody else might have the answer and be able to help with the, with the situation. Okay, so Hazel, I'm gonna let you take over now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laura. We are building on communication. We want to talk about a supporting commu communication skills for staff to use in the moment when responding to family caregivers and anxiety. And one of the models we want to talk about is taking the heat. So when we get a complaint from a family member, we want to resolve the situation amicably and as quickly as possible. Sometimes in the moment though, when someone is complaining, we may feel it is difficult not to be defensive or not to take it personally. We admit there are certain challenging situations 
we may find it is not easy to stay calm and engage in a communication process to find common ground. So we want to outline taking the heat as a model for handling angry or unhappy family caregivers and how to diffuse tense situations. So uh, H in heat is for hear. You really, when you really listen to people, you start to diffuse some of the emotion and anger. But if you don't listen, you will quickly escalate the situation. So hear the person out, let them speak uninterrupted and less, listen with respect. Listen attentively to what the person is saying. Often you will see after two minutes, people will start to calm down and will have had the opportunity to say what is on their mind. Repeat back just to ensure you understand their concerns. The E in the heat stands for empathize. Echo the source of their frustration and show you are trying to understand their position and their situation. For example, you may say, I understand that you're frustrated and I can see why. I would be too. By showing you understand, you can begin to diffuse the situation and validate their experience. The A in heat stands for apologize. This is important even if you are not at fault. You acknowledge their distress and their experience of being upset. Often, the family member who is upset or angry wants to hear is, I'm sorry. For example, when someone has lost a loved one, we may say, I'm sorry for your loss. Even though this loss is not caused by you, we still sharing our empathy. And that's what we think we need to do here. The T in the heat is take responsibility for action. It is important to let the person know what you're going to do or what is your next step or what action you're going to take. The action can be very simple or small. For example, listening to the person and giving them the contact information of someone who is able to help them or sometimes gently, remi gently reminding them of the process. Now we want to show you how the heat model is used. In the first role play, we are not using the heat model. Laura will be the caregiver and I'll be the staff. Laura? All right, you ready for an Oscar winning performance? Hazel, it's a shame I can't see it. <laughs> okay, so yes. I am, oh, go ahead. You are Sandra and I am the staff. I'm the caregiver. My uncle is always yes. in bed and he is not getting the physio that he should. I know he's capable of doing more. Why aren't you helping him? Well, he's refusing and he says he's in pain. We are not allowed to force him and he, he has his rights. Oh, have you even tried to get him back? When's the last time you even tried? Every time I try to get him up, he hits me, calls me names, and tells me to get out. You need to keep trying. You need to try harder. I have no time for this. I have 12 residents, and we are in the middle of the second wave, with short staff, too. What's the DOC's name again? I'm going to call her right now. Sure, go ahead. She's not going to be working with your uncle. He shouldn't be here anyways. So then I would like punch in the number and storm off and walk down the hall, but we're on Zoom, so we won't do that. Okay. <laughs> this ends our first. 
this ends our first role play. So we have a question for you, our, our participants. We are interested to know your thoughts on. We are, we are interested to know your thoughts on how the interaction between the staff and family member went. So please write your comments in the chat box. Some of the comments Stop coming not in. Acknowledged family. So staff do, did not acknowledge family concerns. You are right. Staff took it personally. Staff was very rude. Sure, I felt that way I was. Concern was not acknowledged. Went wrong. Fully frustrations met with frustration. You guys did great. However, it was not therapeutic. There was no validation, no empathy. I matched this voice of the family caregiver. Two sides frustrated. Yes, both were frustrated. Empathize with the caregiver. It's not easy to be part of the care. Yes, ask the family if they have suggestions on supporting family members. You guys are giving good suggestions what can be done. Yeah, the staff could have taken some time to listen actively. Resolutions and solutions explored. No solutions were explored. Neither person listened to the other. <laughs> yes. Okay. You guys have really pointed out what went wrong. In, in, in essence, everything went wrong and both were shouting at each other. So now what we want to do is in the second role play, we will apply the model taking the heat. Thank you for your participation. Yeah, there were some great so, comments there. Okay, so roll, roll, roll two, round two. Okay, my uncle is two. always in bed. He's not getting the physio he should. I know he's capable of doing more. Why aren't you helping him? It sounds like you are frustrated. I would feel frustrated too. He is supposed to be getting his physio twice a week. I know. I know how important his physio is. I can see why you are frustrated. You better believe I'm beyond frustrated. This keeps happening and we are sick of it. Sandra, I'm really sorry. This is really upsetting for you. Today, your uncle is in more pain than usual, and he really did not want to get up. Well, what are you going to do about it? Let's go talk to your uncle now about his pain and see how he feels about doing physio. I can ask the nurse when he received his Tylenol. You know, some days like today, because of the damp weather, your uncle can have more pain than usual. If his pain continues to bother him, I'll speak to the nurse. She can let the doctor know and the doctor may decide to increase his pain mess or order an X-ray of the hip. Why don't we go speak to him now? Yeah, thanks. I'd really like that. Yeah. Let's go. Okay, so that ends our second um, role play. Now the, now, the whole interaction did not take long. Sometimes it may take longer, but you see we, with some uh, patients, as you guys pointed out in the chat box and listening, we can get the team, uh, get the caregiver to be on the same page. We, we say spending time saves time by preventing the escalation and spending so much time to uh, diffuse that or deal with that later, it's best to uh, upload and give some time in the beginning. We move to on discussion. Okay, so the next slide, Mario, next slide, please. 
So Sandra felt heard and validated. She felt comforted by the fact there's an action in place to address her concerns about her uncle. She felt she contributed to improve her uncle's care and inform the PSW she let the family know and the staff will take care of the plan, uh, take care of her, his pain. Next slide. Mario. Laura, you are on. Laura? Yeah, I'm, I'm talking, I just didn't unmute myself. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Okay, so what we're all- Sorry, everyone. Okay, so what we're all- is a very is and everyone is experiencing this differently so the importance of being transparent so, and communication is vital right now so using tools such as taking the validating active listening these are all ways to help reduce stress among caregivers and have really great useful interactions where we can build bridges and work together for the better of the resident. Supports available to any unpaid family, friend, caregiver who uh, is in the community and to the long-term care homes through uh, the Alzheimer's Society, which is where I work. And you'll note here that my email is at the bottom Please feel free to reach out to me should you have questions about resources. Um, many of the great links that we have at the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto. We reach out to everybody in the M postal code, um, whether you're in the community or a long-term care home. I, I happen to work primarily with caregivers in the long-term care homes, but there's so much available for people from the beginning of the illness all the way through. So please reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns. That's great. Thank you, uh, Thanks, Laura and Hazel, for, for this presentation. I'm wondering if people have some questions in relations to situation that they've encountered and, and maybe in reflecting on the HEAT model and some of the suggestions that were made here. Um, how you might have done things differently or, or any insights you want to share. And people are asking- There is a comment asking- uh, I'm just sorry, uh, there is also a request to put the heat slide uh, back um, on the screen if possible. Thank you. Somebody was trying to, starting to chime in. Please go ahead. So uh, I'm wondering, um, uh, Laura, I know you've had a lot, a ton of conversations with, with staff during this COVID pandemic um, around, um, you know, uh, caregivers uh, being anxious and, and, uh, and it's a time where everybody all around is overwhelmed. Uh, what are some um, tips you, you, you could um, um, uh, provide to staff, you know, when they're feeling overwhelmed and they're feeling it's, it's, it's hard for them to, to contain those emotions and all those demands. It really is. And you know, uh, the staff are giving 150% and they're going into work right now, every single day. And I, I don't know what we would do without them. And it's so frustrating because I wish that caregivers could see that side of it as well. Um, I mean, I, and I can't imagine it not, we're all human, right? So I can't imagine it not getting to them um, after a while, as well as you don't know the complex behaviors that they're dealing with day in and day out from the residents as well. So I guess what I, I would say is I honestly think it's very helpful if they can redirect the caregiver to somebody who has time to sit and spend with that caregiver. Um, it, because I recognize that the, the PSWs are so busy, they probably have a, 
depending on the time of day, maybe anywhere between eight and 14 people to be assisting in their basic reg daily needs. So um, I would redirect the caregiver, try your best to, to listen to what the issue is, hear it, say, okay, I, I, what, or is this what you want? Uh, is this what you're looking for? Let me see how I can help you or let me see who, I, who can help you with that instead of just walking off because if it escalates, then everybody's frustrated. And, and sometimes it just, it makes the caregiver react the way that Sandra reacted in, in a really hostile manner. And I mean, the last thing anybody wants to do is get, uh, one of these people who are working so hard and diligently and going in every day in trouble with a supervisor. So I think that if, if that worker would have used some of the heat skills that we talked about with Sandra, it wouldn't have gone to the supervisor. It might not have been cleared up so fast, let's face it, but I think it would have been a better outcome for sure. There are some great comments on the chat, um, and uh, uh, and I just wanted to quote Grace's comment of, about the heat approach that is good for everyone, really, staff to staff, staff to family members, staff to managers, um, staff to clients. Um, I would add to that. Um, so great comment, Grace. Thank you for that. I think it is very uh, concise uh, model, and Rhonda is highlighting for us on the chat another. Um, Another acronym that is called um, ICU um, uh, that was developed at the Reitman Center. It stands for Include, uh, Screen, Educate, Extra Help, and Understand, which is uh, provides it, it uh, provides kind of similar approaches to just another uh, acronym, and it's a great reminder that in the community, um, Alzheimer's Society works also closely with Reitman Center clinicians and also. Um, uh, Baker's clinicians um, all um, working together to support caregivers in the community. Um, and Laura is very much our go-to uh, in long-term care. Uh, in a second, you're gonna see some poll questions um, on the screen uh, to collect your feedback. Um, any uh, other uh, comments, Hazel or Laura from your side? Um, to respond to what was said on the chat or any kind of final tips on how to access supports when people need it? If you don't mind, so I, we came up with this idea in response to caregivers um, calling the facilities so much uh, that they were actually interfering with resident care. And that was a theme that I was seeing across several of the homes that I was working with. And that it's okay to, for staff to say, okay, I, like, I wanna help you, <laughs> but I can't help you 20 times a day and adjust everything for your one person. So the goal when we started to develop this was to give um, facility staff uh, tools and strategies to use with caregivers to reduce, to sort of reduce the escalation and contain the problem until it could be addressed properly. So I, I hope that that's what you got out of this uh, presentation that Hazel and I worked on today. I just want to add one thing that uh, communication and learning uh, how to do it in the moment and how to manage our own reactions is a great thing, but we, it's a skill. And I, I would recommend and I encourage staff to reach out to their um, PRCs, the psychogeriatric resource consultant, to do some uh, practical communication uh, skill practice. You know, you can uh, spend some time, how do I say this? How do I manage uh, the situation? How do I contend? And how do I really practice the skill involved in the HEAT model or many other models that are out there, whichever model that we would like to adopt? Uh, the PRCs can do some training. Thank you. That's wonderful. We are exactly at time. Uh, also highlight, uh, uh, Hazel, if you could mute yourself. Um, I think I'm echoing through your computer. Um, I just wanted to also highlight that on top of uh, providing this education to providers today, um, Laura, that provides a lot of education to the caregivers and families themselves. So with that, uh, I hope we are uh, countering things on both or catching things on both. 
Um, I really want to thank you for this talk that obviously spoke by the, the comments I'm seeing on the chat to many uh, participants today. And I hope we'll, we'll put that take the heat model uh, into practice. Uh, so thank you everybody for participating today. Thank you Hazel and Laura for a great talk. Mario for supporting the slides and uh, Matthew and Agnes and Salma for uh, moderating behind the scenes. Uh, take care, don't forget to join us next week for um, our addiction specialist to talk about smoke cessation in long-term care environment and COVID. Thank you and have a great day.